Welcome to LG Ministry. We really appreciate you watching our program. In this series, we're going to be taking a close look at the book of James. It's going to be fairly in-depth, and at times we will stick right to the verse, but other times we'll break off and talk about the topics that are mentioned within the book of James. So I hope you learn a lot from this series and you get a lot out of it. The book of James was probably the first book written in the New Testament. While there are four men called James in the New Testament, with two of them being apostles, Christian tradition says that Jesus' half-brother named James wrote this particular book because he was a prominent figure in the church in Jerusalem around AD 44 until he was martyred around AD 62. Some date this writing as early as AD 44 to 47, while others date it at a later date such as AD 60. Some consider his letter the most Jewish letter in the New Testament. The book of James was written to the Jewish Christians that were scattered abroad, as the verse first says, to the twelve tribes which were scattered abroad. Many call this book the Proverbs of the New Testament. The reason it is viewed this way is because James moves from one point to the next and it expresses a lot of wisdom just as the book of Proverbs does. It also promotes living a Christian life by being a doer of God's Word instead of just a hearer, James 1, verse 22. James teaches that we show our faith by our works, in James chapter 2. Some think that James and the writings of Paul contradict one another because Paul said in Galatians 2, verse 16, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, Martin Luther called James' letter a right straw epistle. However, he did include James in his translation into the German language, but he stuck the letter in the appendix because he didn't like how it emphasized good works and considered it contradictory to Paul's teachings. He also had Hebrews, Jude, and Revelation in that appendix as well because he considered those books disputable. What people fail to understand is that Paul is saying that we are not justified by the works of the law of Moses, and we cannot work our way into heaven. Paul never taught that we are justified by faith alone. Instead, he teaches that we must have an obedient faith and work out our own salvation. Philippians 2, verse number 12. Paul mentions the need for an obedient working faith in many other passages as well. Acts 26 and verse 20 says this, But declared first to those in Damascus, and in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. Ephesians 2, verse number 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Romans 1, verse number 5, Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. Romans 6 verse 17, But God bethink that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. Romans 16 verse 26, But now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting God for obedience to the faith. So James' message is in perfect harmony with Paul's message. Paul speaks of the faith that works, and James talks about the works of faith. As James states in James 2 verse 20, But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? The name Jesus is only mentioned twice, and the Holy Spirit is not mentioned at all. The word church is only mentioned once, and he cites the Old Testament directly three times. Number one, James 2 verse number 8, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19 verse number 18. Number 2, James 2 verse number 3, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Genesis 15 verse 16. Number 3, 
James 4, verse number 6, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Proverbs 3, verse number 34. Of course, he alludes to the Old Testament many times throughout his letter and uses several Old Testament characters such as Abraham, Isaac, Rahab, Job, and Elijah. Though his letter refers to and quotes the Old Testament, it also presents ideas from a Christian point of view. Some of the points sound similar to those found in the Sermon on the Mount, and there are several parallels between James and 1 Peter. Let's take a quick look at what you'll find in this letter. Chapter 1 talks about pure religion and how we should find joy in trials and pray for wisdom without doubting. Explains how sin develops and how we are taught that God's Word says and how we should be doers of it. Chapter 2 teaches that we should treat the rich and the poor alike and that faith without works is dead. Chapter 3 teaches us about the destructive nature of the unbridled tongue. And chapter 4 warns against worldliness and about boasting about tomorrow because tomorrow may never come. And chapter 5 warns the rich about being selfish, teaches us to be patient until the coming of the Lord, and explains what fervent prayer can do. James will show that one cannot merely claim to be a Christian and be pleasing to God because we must be active Christians who are doing God's Word. There are three key words, faith, it's used 12 times, works, it's used 13 times, and the word doer is used five times. The key phrase is to be doers of the Word, James 1 verse 22, and the key chapter is chapter 1. The overall theme is about how a person's faith will be proven through good works that he maintains throughout his life as opposed to one who just claims to be faithful. I can also see three main themes that are dealt with, which are the uncertainty of wealth, the sins of the tongue, and the necessity of works. The key verse in each chapter is as follows. James 1, verse number 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James 2, verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. James chapter 3, verse 1. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. James 4, verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. James 5, verse number 19. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now here's a brief outline of the chapters. James 1, your faith will be tested and the anatomy of sin is given. James 2, we should be swift to hear and slow to speak and God shows no partiality and neither should we. Faith without works is dead. James chapter 3, the dangers of the uncontrollable tongue the difference between wisdom of man and God. James 4, warnings against worldliness and making unjust judgments of brethren. We must draw near to God. In James 5, we are blessed through patience, prayer, and love. Warnings are given to the rich. Some of the practical lessons we learn from the book of James is as follows. Number one, we must endure the trials of life and remember the benefits of suffering. Number two, we must learn to control our tongues. And number three, 
We cannot think like the world and act like them and expect to find favor with God. Now let's examine the men called James in the Bible. The word James comes from the Greek word ikabos, and it is used 42 times in the New Testament. Out of these 42 times, there are four different men named James. Let's begin with the most obscure James. Our first man called James is referred to as Judas' father, not Iscariot. Luke 6, verse 16. Judas the son of James and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. Acts 1, verse 13 in the King James Version says, James is Judas' brother, but all the other prominent versions says father. This is all that we really know about this man. Our second man called James is referred to as the son of Alphaeus. Matthew 10, verse number 3. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Luke 6, verse 15, Acts 1, and verse number 13. He is also called the son of Mary, Matthew 27, verse 56, among who were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's son. Chapters 15, verse 40, and also Mark 16, verse number 1, and Luke 24 and verse number 10. This man was one of the apostles and was called James the Less, Mark 15, verse number 40. The word less comes from the Greek word mikros, which can mean one who is small, or it can simply mean one who is younger. Either one of these meanings could apply to this James. I must admit it is possible that we have two different men named James here. However, I believe there is enough evidence to show that the above passages are referring to the same man. In order to do this, I must show that Mary and Alphaeus are husband and wife. And the only verse we have linking these two together is a vague one, John 19, verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. Some scholars believe that the word Clopas is another name for Alphaeus. If this is the case, then this would mean that they are indeed husband and wife, and James the Less is their son. If these are two different men, it doesn't really matter in the overall scheme of things. In either case, we know very little about this James. Some sources say that this James preached at Palestine and Egypt. According to tradition, he was thrown down from the temple by the opposing Jews, stoned, and then beat with a club. Whether this is true, we will never know for sure. Our third James, who is also an apostle, is referred to as the son of Zebedee and is usually mentioned with John, his brother, Matthew 4, verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. Again, this can see, be seen in many passages, Matthew 10, verse 2, chapter 17, verse 1, Mark 1, verse 19, and verse 29. And it just goes on and on. And we also see it in Acts 1 and verse 13. We also learn from these passages that James, John, and Peter went along with Jesus by themselves and were privileged to witness many amazing things. His mother was named Salome, which you can surmise by comparing Matthew 27, verse 56, to Mark 15, verse number 40, and also chapter 16 and verse number 1. Let's do that. Matthew 27, verse 56. Among who were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joses, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. Mark 15, verse 40. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joses and Salome. Mark 16, verse number 1. Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him. What you'll notice from these three verses is that they refer to the same time period and they mention these three women being together. Mark's account names them as Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James the Less, and Salome. However, Matthew's account names the first two women and identifies the third woman as the mother of Zebedee's son, which is Salome. This James was the first apostle to be martyred under the direction of King Herod Agrippa in Acts 12 and verse 1 through 2. James was killed by the sword, most likely by decapitation around A.D. 44. Our fourth man named James was the half-brother of Jesus, Matthew 13, verse 55. Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Mark 6, verse number 3. 
At first, none of Jesus' brothers believed in him. John 7, verse 5, For even his brothers did not believe in him. But after Jesus was raised from the dead and had ascended into heaven, his brothers became believers. We learn that they were gathered together with their mother and the apostles and the other disciples in prayer and supplication in Acts 1, verse 13. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary and the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. Paul states that James saw Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 7. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Paul also says he saw James in Jerusalem when he went to see Peter. Galatians 1, verse number 18. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Paul informs us that James was married. 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 5. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles, the brother of the Lord, and Cephas? Now that we've examined all these four men that are called James, we need to turn our attention to some of the passages in Acts and Galatians that refer to James. I believe logic will show us that the James being referred to in these passages are all talking about Jesus' half-brother. In Acts chapter 15, certain Jews began to say, that the Gentiles had to be circumcised in order to be saved, and Paul disagreed. So they were sent to Jerusalem to bring the matter before the apostles and elders of the church. When they arrive, Peter speaks out first, then a second man named James speaks in verses 13 through 20. Since James is making decisions and judgments, we can conclude he is either an apostle or one of the elders of the church. I believe that James was an elder and was speaking for the eldership just as Peter was speaking for the apostles. Those who've examined James' speech and vocabulary see many similarities in the book of James, and they conclude this implies that the author of James and the James in Acts chapter 15 are one and the same. We also have this event recorded in Galatians 2 verses 1 through 10. In verse 9, we see James, John, and Cephas, which is Peter, were considered as pillars of the church. Also in Acts 12 and verse 17, after Peter had escaped prison and made his way into Mary's house, he asked them to let James and the brethren know that he had escaped from prison. Logically, this would be the same James in all these passages because they were in Jerusalem and James is singled out, which implies that he played a prominent role in the church. Also see Acts 21 and verse number 18. We can logically narrow down which of the four men named James are most likely being referred to in these verses. First, we can eliminate Judah's father. Second, we can uh, eliminate James, the son of Zebedee, considering he was killed in Acts 12 and verse number 2 before any of these events happened. And we can also eliminate the James, the son of Alphaeus, and Mary, because every time he is mentioned in the Gospels, he is always referred to as the son of Alphaeus or the son of Mary. We can logically narrow down which of the four men named James are most likely being referred to in these verses. First, we can eliminate Judah's father. Second, we can eliminate James, the son of Zebedee, considering he was killed in Acts 12 and verse number 2 before any of these events happened. We can also eliminate James, the son of Alphaeus and Mary, because every time he is mentioned in the Gospels, he is always referred to as the son of Alphaeus or the son of Mary. There was always a distinction made so that no one was confused about which apostle named James was being talked about. Not to mention the fact that we only see this James mentioned in the Gospels. The half-brother of Jesus fits the time frame perfectly, and the early writers such as Josephus and the words of Hegapus, as recorded by Eusebius, confirm that Jesus' half-brother was a man who stood out in the community and was martyred for proclaiming Jesus as the Son of God. Josephus writes, Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. Eusebius writes, Hegapus, who belongs to the generation after the apostles, 
gives the most accurate account of him, that is James, was called the just by all men from the Lord's time to ours, since he was holy from his mother's womb. He used to enter alone into the temple and would be found kneeling and praying for forgiveness for the people, so that his knees grew hard like a camel's because of his constant worship of God, kneeling and asking forgiveness for the people. So the scribes and Pharisees made James stand on the battlement of the temple. And James answered, Why do you ask me concerning the Son of Man? So they went up and threw down the just, and they said to one another, Let us stone James the just. And they began to stone him, since the fall had not killed him. But he turned and knelt, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, God and Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. All these things strongly imply that James, the half-brother of Jesus, is the man being spoken of in these passages. He also fits perfectly as being the author of James. Finally, the book of Jude, ascribed to Jesus' other half-brother, Jude, says, Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Jude 1, verse number 1. It's almost like Jude is using his brother's name for validation. Once again, the best man that would fit the description is Jesus' half-brother. In conclusion, James is one of the most practical and needed letters for every generation of Christians. He denounces social injustice and worldliness. His goal for Christians is to remain faithful to God and to never lose sight of heaven. There is so much wisdom for us to gain throughout this letter. There is so much I could say about this beautiful letter by James in this introduction, but let's begin to dig into the text itself in our next lesson. I sure do appreciate you listening to my lesson today. I hope that you found it something that is biblical, something that was encouraging, or maybe again challenged you to change your life, or just maybe gave you something to think about. I think it's so important that we listen and that we study God's Word as much as we can. Now, one thing I want to be clear on is I want you to never take my word at just because I say it so. Now, I do my best to study God's Word, and I try to make sure that I'm always presenting the truth. But I am just a man. I can make mistakes. So compare what I say to God's Word. If you do that, you can't go wrong. And if you find that I'm teaching something that is incorrect, I mean, you can turn to Scripture and you can say, look what it says here. Please contact me and let me know because I'm very concerned. I want to make sure that I am proclaiming the truth. Another thing that you can do that will be helpful to you is you can go on YouTube, you can search out LG Ministry, and you can look for my videos there as well. And you will find, uh, I don't know, it's over like, I think it's close to 500 videos now or more. But there will be many lessons that you can continue to watch and you continue to grow from. Please let people know about this so that other people can see the truth taught. Again, I hope you have a wonderful day. And I hope that you continue to run the race and to remain faithful to God until the day that you die. Well.